Welcome to this edition of the Virtual Space TV. I'm Amanda Bush, your host. Today, we are going to focus on space tourism, possibly one of the most important future driving factors of space commercialization. Nice to have you with me. Since Yuri Gagarin's flight in 1961, people going into space have traveled on rockets designed and operated by government bureaucracies. In the US, private industry worked closely with NASA, but the agency dictated all aspects of the design, construction, and operation of its rockets. Until 2001, space travelers had their trips paid for by governments, or, in a few cases, by companies. No one simply decided to go to space, and paid for the trip out of their own pocket. In other words, no tourism allowed. Ten years ago, someone did pay their own way to space. The arrival of the first space tourist on the International Space Station marked, not just the start of private trips to space, but the start of the commercialization of space. The age of private space travel had begun. By the way, there is a very nice broadcast from my colleague Miles O'Brien, called Space Tourism Turns 10. Watch it on milesobrien.com. It is really worth having a look at. Earlier this month, Famous billionaire Richard Branson and a hundred or so space tourists in waiting, plus some miscellaneous celebrities, all came to New Mexico to celebrate a special event. The completion of a terminal and hangar facility at a commercial spaceport under construction near Las Cruces. Branson's Virgin Galat company is the anchor tenant for Spaceport America. Within a year or two, the first six of Virgin Galactic's customers will board a spaceship tour at the terminal, and they will be carried to about 15 kilometers in altitude by a white knight to aircraft and dropped. The rocket engine will quickly fire and zoom the travelers, along with two pilots, up to 100 kilometers, the official boundary of space. The passengers will enjoy the thrill of riding a rocket, they will experience several minutes of free fall, and observe the beauty and curvature of the earth below, and the grand canopy of the dark and sparkling cosmos above. The vehicle soon falls back into the atmosphere, and glides back for a landing at the spaceport. Eventually several such flights will take place every day. This sort of up and down jaunt, is called suborbital space tourism. It doesn't provide the extended stay in space of an orbital flight, but is far less expensive, though not exactly cheap. Virgin Galactic is charging $200,000 for each ticket. Let us now enjoy the remaining part of the video.
Virgin Galactic is not the only company developing suborbital spaceships. Excor Aerospace, for example, based in Mojave, California, is developing the Lynx rocket plane, which will take off from a runway and reach 100 kilometers without the need for a carrier plane. The pilot and passenger will remain seated in a compact cabin, but will still have a tremendous view of the Earth and sky. And the price is only $100,000. Excor has built and flown two low altitude rocket planes already, and the Lynx is now under construction. The firm's liquid fueled engines are extremely reliable and expected to fire for hundreds, even thousands of times with little wear and tear. Another private company developing a suborbital space vehicle is Armadillo Aerospace in Texas. Their vehicle goes straight up and straight back down, just like in the old space sci-fi movies. The company Blue Origin, owned by Amazon billionaire Jeff Bezos, is building similar vehicles. These and other firms hope to begin suborbital flights within a couple of years and give Virgin Galactic a fight for the space tourism market. With competition and high flight rates, suborbital space flight ticket prices should fall to the low tens of thousands of dollars within a few years. The ultimate in space tourism, of course, is a flight to orbit. Dennis Dito in 2001 became the first person to pay his own way to orbit when he rode a Russian Soyuz rocket to the International Space Station. Six other space tourists have since followed him. Despite the astounding cost of about $25 million, there would have been many more than this, but there were only that many Soyuz seats available for private customers over that time. The visitors to the ISS all say it was one of the greatest experiences of their lives. One of them, Charles Simonia, even paid to go twice. Microgravity is, of course, a particular highlight of going to space. However, observing the magnificent Earth below is said to be endlessly captivating and worth the trip. The high cost has been the biggest barrier to private space travel. The builders of the suborbital spaceships believe the lessons they learn from flying rocket vehicles routinely to 100 kilometers will allow them to build low-cost orbital vehicles in a few years. Other companies, though, are skipping the suborbital step and are going directly to orbital rockets. The end of the Space Shuttle program has left NASA in need of transportation to space. The agency is working with commercial companies to develop vehicles for bringing cargo and crews to the ISS. This will accelerate the arrival of commercial transportation to orbit. One company that NASA is working with is SpaceX, which was founded by Elon Musk, who made a fortune as a dot-com entrepreneur. His long-term goal is to reduce the cost of getting to orbit by as much as a factor of 100 from current prices. Such reductions are feasible by making the space vehicles fully and rapidly reusable. This would bring orbital ticket prices down to the current charge for suborbital flights. At such prices there would certainly be many thousands of customers. But where will so many private space tourists go? The ISS can only handle one or two at a time. Fortunately, there are serious efforts going on to develop private space stations. Robert Bigelow, the owner of the Budget Suites company in the U.S., is dedicating several hundred million dollars to the development of large space habitats. They are based on expandable technology originally developed by NASA and will offer much more room than the ISS modules. His company has already successfully placed two prototypes into orbit. They will be ready to launch their full-scale habitats as soon as private passenger spaceships like that from SpaceX and Boeing are flying. There is also orbital technologies, 
a Russian company that plans to put a commercial space station in orbit later this decade. The reliable Soyuz crew vehicles and Progress cargo vessels would provide the transportation to the seven-person station. So within a decade, we could see private spaceships routinely delivering space tourists to private space stations on a monthly, and even weekly schedule. The era of true spacefaring will have finally arrived. High flight rates will drive down the costs for space travel and space facilities, and this in turn will attract even more people to space. Some will eventually want to stay there permanently. Rotation of space stations will provide gravity and shielding will protect space residents from radiation just as our atmosphere protects people on the ground. The fact that tourism could drive all this should be no surprise. Tourism is one of the largest industries on Earth and is the mainstay economic force in many countries and will soon be the largest industry in space. It will drive the expansion of humanity into the solar system. We will be back with the next show by mid of November. You can find us as usual on www.hobbyspace.com. Stay tuned.